what's up. Wow, what a week. What a week it's been. And thank you again, Marius and your team for pulling things together. I couldn't think of a, a more ideal week uh, to do what you've done. And what we've done is to join together and to collaborate related to creating our futures. Um, and it's a joy to be with people that work the future together and um, in the association. I'm, and so I want to present to you Peter Bishop. I think most of you know Peter or know of him. Uh, he's been an extraordinary coach, mentor, friend, colleague. Uh, and, and, and I mentioned in my intro to the conference that, uh, you know, what if we, if we asked that question, it was we, uh, Peter, uh, supporting me that helped create the university a program at Regent University and that two to 300 grads later now, Peter, it's been core your success as not just mine and others. And now it's uh, Virginia Richardson's teaching there. But uh, I wanted to just show you that Peter's had an extraordinary life uh, in, in uh, teaching at Jesuit high school. He taught algebra. His general work, he was teaching sociology, social problems, uh, focus work. He went to UHCL uh, as an Prof of Human Sciences in the University of Clear Lake program, which was a future studies program. And Peter became the chair of that program, I believe, in 1984. That was right at the time when they turned from a research master's to a professionalization uh, master's. And really, Peter's been at the ground floor of professionalizing futures from the ground up. Uh, he took a, a, a leap uh, into into the beyond uh, related to the convergent life, as I would call it, and uh, to pass and build a legacy with Teach the Future. And that was in, I think, 2015, Peter, if I remember correctly. It was um, the website, you know, is teachthefuture.org, uh, preparing students for today to teach the future, uh, tomorrow to teach the future today. Uh, Peter's been instrumental in writing uh, in the not only teaching about the future at the tertiary level, but future thinking playbooks, all kinds of curriculum resources. Here's the, it's featured in Greek language, uh, a playbook by the Teach the Future. Wherever educators and future educators are uh, gathered, you'll find <clears throat> Peter Bishop in the center. It's been that way for 30 to 40 years. Uh, here's some of his colleagues today, and some of them are on our call today. Peter, you should give a shout out get going here to some of your colleagues, uh, Janine and Rosa and Aletha and Erica, uh, just extraordinary team he's built all around the world of educators. Um, Peter, you might remember, but you and I were bunk mates in Sweden in 19, uh, 2008 in uh, Trollhatten. And uh, again, wherever future educators gather, there's Peter Bishop in the middle. And I'm, I'm over there and we had a fantastic time with educators from Europe and around the world. Um, now look, I don't always do memes, but uh, Peter, <laughs> when I do it, it becomes a marketing success. So uh, get ready for this and grab your Dos Equis, right? Um, we should teach the future as much as the past. That was Peter's logo and mantra. I don't know what's gonna be on your gravestone, Peter. But I know a lot of us will be indebted to you for life. If you've not had a chance to meet Peter or be mentored by him or to work with him or to be amazed by him, you should. He's pragmatic. He's generous. He's honest. Uh, and he's a deep person in his thinking as well as his life and relationships. So, Peter, bring us a message on foresight as a social competence. We're looking forward to it. Thank you for your legacy, your work with APF folks. It continues to today. He's the membership uh, head of the membership committee. So if you turn an app to join APF, you'll have to pass the bar, you know, with Peter and his team. And I've appreciated your work, Peter, with all of us invest in our lives. Thank you so much. It's a no, no more fitting way to close collaborate 2020 for the Associate Professional Futures than to go to our, uh, one of our founding professional futures and exemplary members. Peter Bishop, bring it on. Wow. <laughs> okay, Jay, I think I better quit now while I'm ahead. What do you think? <laughs> I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> but no, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I was, uh, I think, uh, awed, I guess, honored and privileged to, to be approached by Marius and the team there, the Collaborate team, Terry Grimm and, and, and Tricia and everybody else. 
um, I'm reminded that it, uh, th uh, there is a phrase from the Bible, of course, that a prophet in his own land is hardly ever recognized. And one of my favorite quotes, uh, it was 25 years at the University of Houston before I was allowed to give a talk about the future. <laughs> so, well, we know him. He doesn't know anything. He's just, you know, he's just down the hall. What is this deal? And so that was that. That's what this reminded me of. It only took P APF, you know, twenty years to do a keynote for APF, but it's a pleasure at long last. You hang around long enough, somebody's going to ask you to talk about the future. I figure, and that's what that's what we're doing here. So it 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 is a pleasure. It's been a great. I, I apologize. I haven't been in the sessions until today, but I saw all the sessions today. It was uh, great with your town hall, seeing the status of the APF, uh, the, uh, the, the, the walk down memory lane with Cindy and, and Vern and, and, uh, and Jennifer, of course. Uh, and then the, the, I have to tell you, I, this is my first experience with Miro and congratulations to Terry. A, a blizzard, a blizzard of ideas in that last uh, AI uh, board. In fact, I'm gonna capture a couple of that here today. So. It's been a great day for me and a great day, of, you know, warms my heart to remember back in the days when we not only were teaching futures to a few people in the 1980s, it wasn't a very big program then, and now at an association of almost 500 people uh, practicing it. So it's my, it's my pleasure. I have to, uh, and I appreciate the, uh, the review of my background, Jay, and, and you did a really good job, but I also have a slightly different version uh, that I want to share with you here. I guess I'm going to share my screen. And the title of my talk uh, uh, is Foresight is a Societal Competence, but I'm also uh, sharing with you the, uh, a new title, which I'm going to call Revolution in Thought. Um, I, I would hate to put too cosmic a, a purpose. I'm, I'm trying to get everybody on the screen that I can here. Too cosmic a purpose here. But um, I do want to point out that I believe and we have here with this group and with this association and with this profession, we are actually creating an historic movement of thought. And I come to this with, an, with a, a, a not unique, but certainly an extended view of social change. Because in my early life, as opposed to the things that Jay talked about, I call myself a virtual time traveler. I went to school in St. Louis at a Jesuit high school there and joined the Jesuit Society of Jesus right after that. Uh, this is a picture of the seminary there. And one of the things I carried away, I'm not a particularly religious person anymore, but boy, I sure learned a lot of Latin and Greek. And <laughs> that was, and so you get a, you get a sense of, of a culture that you know, if it's a Western culture. I wish I'd had the same um, opportunity in, in Eastern or Islamic or Indian cultures, but nevertheless, I got a sense of living in, in, a, in an ancient world. Joining the Jesuits was a, uh, uh, a chance to work and live in this seminary. And we were one of the last groups that actually, uh, they put us away essentially threw away the key. Uh, no TV, no radio. This is the 1960s. Uh, my memory of the Cuban crisis was the, the retreat master at that time said, oh, there's a little conflict over Cuba, but it's not going to amount to anything. <laughs> so no TV, no radio, very, very little contact with family. And so it was an immersion into the literally the Renaissance culture when the Jesuits were created, along with a lot of asceticism and things like that. So when I popped out of the seminary, I realized uh, that I was now living a secular life, living in, in the modern world in the early 1970s. And I said, wow, this is really different. <laughs> the people who are around me don't really realize the fundamental perspective, assumptions, beliefs, values, you name it, the whole way of life. And what is interesting to me, the way of thinking that goes into modern society compared to. So my, my time horizon in this sense is centuries, not necessarily decades or even years, but centuries and where we are today in history in the societal and the century level development of thoughts about the future. I actually found out a lot early in my futures career from a book uh, called The Idea of Progress. Uh, J.B. Bury, obviously a young social scientist in the 1920s. 
Uh, I assign portions of this in my, cl in my class on social change, what Cindy's teaching now these days. Uh, and they said, wait a minute, we can't read that book. It's old. <laughs> but my point was that old ideas sometimes are still relevant. And we, we read that book. And, and Beery's uh, main point was that the idea of progress originated in the 18th century. Uh, that there, there had been maybe smattering uh, writings about progress prior to that, but this is the first time it became a meme. This is the first time it actually took hold that society was on some kind of, in that case, an upwardly trending line of, of, uh, of growth and improvement, that, that the human society was improvable, indeed perfectible. And there are three thinkers during that period of time uh, that were um, that I think were particularly important, two French intellectuals and then our friend Thomas Malthus. Uh, Mercier wrote the first utopia in the future. It was along the lines of Thomas More's utopia, which were invented in the 16th century, but this is the 18th century. The difference is that More did not put his utopia in the future. We kind of assume all utopias in their future. No, this was during the age of exploration. And so the trope was that uh, ship gets blown off course, he enters a storm, enters an island, and then all of a sudden he's with, uh, their, the shipmates are with this perfect society, and why can't we all be like that? And that was his utopia. It took 200 years to put utopias into the future as a provable and perfectible form of society. Uh, Marquis de Condorcet wrote a nonfiction version of uh, the future, uh, basically saying, if progress continues this way, uh, it will go on this way. And then, of course, we even had alternative futures in the 18th century, because Thomas Malthus came along and said, nay, nay, <laughs> what we'll do if you improve the health and the food supply, all people will do is have more kids, and they'll eat more, and therefore they're going to eat their way down and, and remain in poverty for the whole rest of the, the rest of time. There is no perfectibility. So already in the 18th century. So what was it about the 18th century that created this concept of the future? Well, it's a hypothesis, of course, but a, I think a fairly easy one to see is that social change for the first time in history had become apparent to people uh, in their lives. For the most change, I mean, we know the change is perennial. It goes on all the time. But prior to the 18th century, most societal level change took multi-generations. People literally were born, they grew up, they lived and they died in generally the same society that they were born into. If they were peasants, they were always peasants. If they were the king, they were always the king. Now there was change, I mean, the moon and the sun, and famines came and wars came and prosperity came and went and all of that, and people lived and died. They got all that. But the measure of, and let me, I just skipped over this other thing, this, this beautiful chart here of the medieval layers of society. That was considered permanent. And surely it wasn't all medieval, but if you go back to the Roman Empire, you go back to the Egyptian Empire, you go back to India and China, these things lasted for centuries. And people didn't think that society actually went through changes. People did, and, and time did, but the changes were much. So I, I would even go further on Beery's uh, hypothesis, not that progress was invented, but the concept of social change was in fact invented at the same time. He didn't say that, but I've really extended that. So people didn't realize that they were in a period of social change. So what do these 18th century folks say? Well, gee, I realize now that my life is a little bit different than my father's, my grandfather's, my mother's, my grandmother's. And oh, well, let me think again. I think my children's life might actually be different. So that there are possibilities of change coming forward. And I think that was the beginning of what I might call the intellectual foundation of future studies, of thinking about the future the way we do today. We come on to the 19th century and three, I think, thinkers in those days, Auguste Comte, the father of sociology, my, my earlier field, basically tried to put social affairs on a scientific basis. He was very much a positivist, certainly don't agree with most of what he said, but nevertheless, he did have kind of phases of development of society. 
And he also divided this brand new field of sociology into two main divisions. We call them social statics and social dynamics. And we'll see in a minute that we are now studying a lot about social statics, a lot about society, very little, unfortunately, about social dynamics. So it's there, it's on the table, but I don't think we're using it as much. Of course, Jules Verne treated us to a future of fantastical machines and processes and moonshots and underground submarines and all of that kind of stuff. And Edward Bellamy, a more modern utopian writer, looking backward, was a, was a huge phenom around the turn of the century. Uh, clubs were put together. Why can't we be this way? Why can't we be this way? So future studies in the 19th century was beginning to grow up. In the 20th century, I believe it became uh, more scientific and more professional. H.G. Wells, of course, best known for his science fiction, but he was also quite an intellectual and wrote this uh, this book called Anticipations. If you look at what he was talking about, he was a predictive forecaster. Okay, we won't hold that against him. He got really a lot of stuff right about the 20th century. It was a very prescient book, an interesting one for that purpose. The two real developments in both forecasting and planning, the first was uh, William Ogburn, another sociologist, was asked by Herbert Hoover to head a commission on trends. They had never cataloged trends up till the 1930s. And they published this report on demographics and economics and techno technological trends. And right before that, Harvard had come up with this idea called a policy model, which is considered the beginning of strategic planning. So we have a scientific basis for thinking about the future, for describing the future in trends, and a, and a scientific or at least professional basis about uh, planning for the future in terms of strategic planning. That's the basis of what we're doing. I do believe the 21st century, however, needs to, and in fact, it might even be dawning as we speak here today on another era of thinking about the future. I'm gonna borrow a title from a primer EU conference that I intended in October of 2019, uh, and that is Futures for All. That's a very, very important, important idea, and I'm gonna elaborate that as we go along. What does every person need to know and be able to do about change and the future to be successful in this century? Now, some people, I, I, I hate the term, <laughs> some people will consider me a leader, <laughs> okay, let me not, you know, not argue about that, but there's a phrase about leadership that I think is true most importantly today. If, if you want to be a leader, find out the way the people are going and follow them. I have been stunned by the amount of discussion just in today's sessions, all three of them, how much people are interested in, in implementing Futures for All. We are a professional association, but in, in this sense, uh, there is an opportunity to do something of historic value, which is bringing the insights and the perspectives that we have as foresight professionals to the rest of society. We're, are we doing that now? Well, unfortunately not. As I said, in, in sociology, where you would think you would learn about social change, about how change moves from era to era, and all the things that we teach our clients and our, and, and, and our students about change would be in sociology. So if you look, though, at the top 10 textbooks in sociology, intro textbooks, and you look at the table of contents, how much attention is being paid to social change? Hardly any at all. 16 semester, 16 weeks in a semester, 16 chapters. Oh, those sociologists are so, so clever. They know exactly how many chapters to put in a textbook. And it's, oh, the, there is only one chapter on change. Remember, Auguste Comte, social statics, social dynamics. Now we are 15 of 16 chapters on social statics and one of 16 chapters. And guess what? It's always the last chapter. Oh, come on now. <laughs> when were you in a course when you actually got to the last chapter? This is Christmas, you know, in the North at least. You're struggling, you're trying to get out of there, you're studying for exams. So the professor says, oh, there's a couple more chapters. You can read those on your own, you know, on, on, on your own time. So are we really teaching much about social change? 
Absolutely not. And another term I want to bring up and also make a contrast, and that's a term about literacy. We have lots of literacies today. Literacy, of course, is reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> and there, now we have media literacy and information literacy, and cultural literacy, financial literacy. Shouldn't we have futures literacy? Now, I have to hurry on to make a distinction. Our good friend Riel Miller has pretty well trademarked the term futures literacy, but I used small letters rather than capital letters in the futures literacy I'm talking about. I mean, his contribution is important, it's, it's wonderful, it's profound, but this is all of what we do, not a particular theory or a particular approach. So futures for all to means, to means to me that we are not only preparing foresight professionals in our graduate programs, we are not only helping people who are giving the assignment to do something about the long-term future in our certificate programs, but we should be preparing the rest of the population who are not going to be futurists and may never actually do a scenario. They may never be asked, they never, never asked to be a foresight person, but everybody needs to have a literacy. I make the distinction between financial literacy. Financial literacy is not double entry bookkeeping. Now, accountants will love to share with their students, and I'm sure accounting professors do, how to do that. But you can, you can be a financially literate person without knowing the rules of accounting. And so we're talking about a different form of education and a different form of thinking and a different form of life. I'm going to pause for a moment because we're going to go into a session here in, in a moment. I'm making a claim here that we as a professional, as a profession, and the APF as, the, as a leading, if not the leading professional association, as a responsibility to support this Futures for All. Am I allowed to ask people if they have a question, John or Marius or Jay? Okay, any, any, any questions about this right now before we get into the first collaboration? Just raise your hand, I can't see you all. Yes, Brian, please. You, um, you criticized sociology for not teaching social change. Is any other academic discipline doing a better job? I don't think so. Do you, do you think, of, can you think of one? Nah. <laughs> I mean, most of our, most disciplines, even history, is what I'll call cross-sectional. It's a deep dive into a time or even an issue, but rarely are they telling the whole story of change. When we moved from University of Houston Clear Lake to the University of Houston, the August faculty at this research university required every student to take a statistics course. And when I looked at the course that we were, uh, we were supposed to take, it was all about social surveys. It was all about psychology experiments. It was all cross-sectional. All the data was occurring at the same time. Literally, I had a hard time finding a stat textbook that actually talked about trend extrapolation, that talked about a change over time, growth rates. It's not in the, it's not in this ordinary curriculum. So no, I don't think anybody is, Brian, thank you. Hey, Peter, this is John oh, Burke. Thank you, Sam, thanks. hey, good to see you. Thanks so much. I really enjoy this. I'd suggest that the discipline of science and technology studies, uh, which is relatively new, is, uh, is trying to do that. And it integrates sociology as one of the three areas. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, I think uh, that the, the uh, I really enjoy that term of social dynamics because it pulls in a lot of different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And what seems to be missing, and STS tries to do this, is the integrative function right. to pull it, pull it all together, which I, I think you, uh, this types of literacy you really highlighted well. So thank you so much. So I, and, I, and I agree with you, Jim. And of course, they're teaching about planning and change and forecasting in business schools and to some extent in public administration, but those are professional programs. SDS is usually a professional program. It's not general education. It's not coming to all of the students in the college. It's those who pick it up. Sure, there, there's, there's big history. So there are certain historians who study about the longitudinal aspects of change, but those ideas do not get into a high school history class. Yeah, I, I, agree. I agree with you. 
Yeah, Great. 100%. As a matter of fact, STS is, is somewhat like, like futures and, and foresight. It <laughs> actually, gets no respect. <laughs> I always ask, I tell people, if you want to get a, we don't have very many, if any, real doctoral programs. Marius is getting one or whatever. But that STS is a good way of going into graduate school. Other questions? Not here. Yes, I'm going to comment. All right. Please. Yes. Yes. Myself or the other person? Go ahead, Claire. Yeah. Yeah, just um, just what Mark said. I, from a point of view of somebody who was worked in, in development, um, planning, development assistance industry, I can tell you that I don't think that the people who are quote unquote in the public policy spaces, um, certainly those who are doing international relations, um, often do not come to the table with a sense of the future, having tried to put it in the space. And there are a few of us in that space have been trying to push it, but it's, I mean, UNDP now, as you see, and UNESCO are talking about it. Awesome. Um, but but even, even in engineering, one of the things that I'm trying to have um, them think about is, it's, I mean, you're building a bridge to last for 30 years or something lasts for 40, a power company, but your engineers are not given like a whole systems framework of the fact of what is that society in which you are designing this thing to last for that number of years. What's amazing, so, uh, Claire, I mean, what's amazing, the, the whole field is called development, <laughs> which is a term that has change at its root, and yet <laughs> there's not so much as could be. Somebody else wanted to ask or make a comment. Peter? Yes, please. Peter. Hello, this, this is an Hello. Um, when you said create a historical movement of thought, I replaced yeah. historical with social movement, and which puts you in the um, the advocacy arena. And so, I'm, one of the questions I don't want to read too much or put words in your mouth, but in a way, are you asking us to up our game as advocates for the future? <laughs> you, you've read my mind, Annette. We've had too many <laughs> collaborative <laughs> things. I'm going to get to that. Yes, absolutely. In fact, let me now turn to the first collaboration. Since this is collaborative, uh, I wanted to give you the chance to use this new amazing tool that John has set up for us. And there is a question that I would like you to discuss in small groups. Where, where is this? Oops, I was on the wrong thing. Collaboration number one. Uh, we're going to have six groups. Uh, there are going to, uh, we have, uh, John, how many uh, folks do we have now? You know? We have uh, 42 on, so okay. six groups Perfect. work really well, Peter. Per six groups, seven each. Boy, look, look, look at the math. I just do that in my head. Um, all right, so there are three questions. So if we were to actually share, teach, communicate futures for all, what should, what, what should we be communicating? What are the ideas that we think as professional, as foresight professionals, that we have about social change in general, that we have about describing and anticipating the futures of the world, and that we have about creating and influencing change. These are three big topics, I think, that if we are to become advocates, as Annette points out, for futures for all, we need to come together as a profession, and not everybody's teaching the same thing. But I think if you ask a sociologist, what is there about small groups? If you ask an SDS person, if you ask an engineer, if you ask a mathematician, what is it that the ordinary high school student, what is it that the ordinary college student should know? If you ask people in financial literacy, what is it that they should know about money and managing money that's not entry bookkeeping, it's not the gap standards, it's what do you do with your money and how does it work? what the, they have developed more or less some things like that. I don't think we've developed those yet. And so this may be the very first time in this collaboration, uh, number one, to articulate for yourself, if you had to, and I'm, I'm, I'm going on here because I'm giving you the chance to be thinking before we jump into the breakout groups. If you're in group number one, what would you like to tell everybody about social change? What should they know about social change? If you're in group number one or two, if you're in th three or four, what would you tell them about getting ready for, anticipating, describing coming futures, the futures that we talk about as professionals? And finally, if you're in group five or six, what would you tell them about creating change, about influencing the future? 
about doing something about the state of the world for yourself, for your families, for your communities. It doesn't have to be macro global, even your community or your organization. So if you have something in your mind, you got to have all those three in your mind because you don't know which group you're going to be in. But we ask you to spend 15 minutes first discussing and then somehow, and, and John's got the magic of Miro all set up for you, come back with three to five things which we can put on a board so that we can, uh, we can do that. So John, you want to put us into the groups? First, uh, let me just uh, share this screen. Is it sharing right. now? Yeah, it is. Thank you very um, much. Yeah. We're all really familiar with the mural boards. Uh, we've divided this session up into the six groups. You can see the questions there. They're also in the chat for the, for the main session, but you'll lose that when you go into the groups. Anyway, so you're going to go into the six groups. There's lots of sticky notes there. You can add your own and you can fill them all in. Great. Okay, John, you're going to pull the trigger. Rudolf, I have assigned you to a group. Uh, have you received the request? Hello, Peter. Ah, uh, you're still muted. Yes, now I'm now I'm unmuted. Yeah, one minute. Uh, you didn't get put in a group. I was. I came into a group and then I was thrown out again. Oh, really? Okay. I heard somebody. Uh, I saw a group of six people and suddenly I was gone again. Well, when John comes back, uh, we'll. Um, have or, or Marius will ask them to yeah. uh, to do that. How are you doing? I just admitted you to, to yes. APF, Thank I you think. So much. Nice to meet yes, you finally. You All yes, right. That's great. That's, you're getting uh, a great little, uh, you're in South Africa, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, you're getting a great little community there. Okay. Well, yes. we got one uh, it's, it's wonderful to see how also the group from Stellenbosch on Cape Town is really right. Pulling their weight now a lot more than in previous years. Well, Janine is uh, one of our key people uh, at uh, yes. Stellenbosch graduate and, and runs our, our South African operation for Teach the Future very much. So. Yes, no, that's uh, spectacular. Yeah. And uh, when I did the strategic foresight course with Jay Gary from 2011 onwards. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're one of the graduates from Regent. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It was uh, so precious just to build on the material that you had been developing and had been teaching over years and then seeing some of Jay's expanding some of the material and helping us understand foresight and social change and all these issues. Um, for me, it's been a strange process. Um, I, I went through all the course material and basically finished that in about 2014. And so for the past years, I've been trying to basically express this in my work context. And uh, 
this last year I've really slowed down and haven't really done much actively, but it's become a process of just almost assimilating everything internally. So the last year I've been reading your, working through your book of teaching the future. Oh, which wonderful. Is That's good. Thank course. you. Yes, Hope and it was, it's so helpful just to put all the puzzle pieces together again and to really think through these processes, like this whole chapter you've got on the, on the, Theories of change was is yeah, there's so, a chapter so, on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, um, that's always where I start. I teach a lot of training programs yes. now that I'm not with the university, but I always begin with okay. change, even before the future. Yes. Let's understand how things change. I Obviously, mean, Jay, if we, change, Jay, we wouldn't be interested in the future at all. Yeah, <laughs> so. I mean, Jay, explain to us while we're studying that foresight is really the study of change. Let's start there. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what he said, and and he's right. Yeah, yeah. and so um, and so just in recent times, I've been so much more on a journey of processing. What does this mean to me personally, and how can I express this future thinking in my life? Right, way way beyond just using tools or things like that. But uh, and and so the questions you pose for our small groups, I've been really wrestling with them for years now, and and. Uh, and because I haven't typically seen good, clear models of what a social change look like and how do journeys look like, I've just mapped them out myself. Yeah. And so um, over the last two years, I've mapped out a whole lot of processes. How does personal change look like for me as an individual? Mm -hmm. um, what sort of phase would I go through life? Um, how does change move from one person to a small group to a bigger group to society? Um, how do we help other people change? How do we equip people so that they can change others? And so um, I've been trying to look at how do all these elements fit together because I'm not really seeing that in a concise and compelling way. And so whenever well, I'm involved in media networks, then I try and help people understand, well, what does change look like and what do we actually want to do to facilitate change? Right. The, so uh, the broadcasting uh, network we're in, if, yeah, the broadcasting a, network we're in, we're broadcasting so many programs, but nobody really understands how change works. And so they don't know how to measure it and what to even look for. Right. So this is exactly the topic we're talking about. In other words, uh, if there were to be a follow-up, and we'll talk about that before the session is over, what are the things that we should all be learning ourselves personally about change, at not including mm -hmm. uh, all the things that we do in our professional life? And, and we could teach our children and, and, and practice in our families and, and do those things. That's what I mean by futures yes. for all. It's not uh, doing scenarios yes. or yeah. plans. It's basically yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a habit of mind. It's, it's a thinking about uh, an approach, how we yes. think about the future. Yeah, yeah, Great. yeah. And so then also when I work in, in wider networks, not just in media, but, but other, let's say, advocates and change agents, they often are passionate about a topic, but they don't really understand how does their niche fit into the rest of society and, and how do they really do initiatives so that this has got long, uh, let's say long lasting effect. Mm -hmm. um, right. Fortunately, I don't, you wouldn't say fortunately, but in this time of the pandemic, people begin to relate a lot better to our cause because <laughs> now suddenly they see a virus spreading exponentially Mm -hmm. and, they re and they suddenly realize, oh, when you talk of systems thinking and that everything fits together, they understand those concepts now. And also when right. you talk of exponential growth with these sort of reinforcing loops, they can also get it now because they've experienced the virus. In the past, and, and, they couldn't relate to that. And I'm afraid sometimes I get rather uh, curmudgeonly at this point. I say, why weren't you listening to this before? <laughs> now you see yeah, how yeah, uncertainty yeah. is running the world. Now there's a, tr a lot more of it than there used to be. And disruption is, is afoot. Yeah, yeah. But we should have been thinking and learning yeah, yeah. all about all that before. Right. Yes, yes. Good. Well, I, yeah, I sent um, an email to John. That's the only way I have to communicate to these folks. I don't know how to do it otherwise. So, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, in Zoom, you can't communicate with them. Once John has gone off to a small group, there's no <laughs> way to connect with him. Well, you'd think he'd like come back yeah, to so when, and rescue you. <laughs> you. You can't message Jim. Um, and that's what, when, when I run Zoom meetings, then we, we get our cell phone out and we communicate via WhatsApp yeah. with each other because we can't, as a team, we cannot talk with each other here. 
Well, I've been trying to uh, get connected with him because he's in Australia and I'm in California. And, and I keep saying, don't you have WhatsApp? Can't we, you know, kind of use it? And he never has responded on that one. So uh, we'll be, they'll be back in a yeah, few minutes. Yeah. We'll, we'll get started. You'll see the, yeah, uh, yeah. you'll see the results. Yeah. So what, uh, uh, what so Peter, are you I'm, in, Rudolph? I'm busy. Um, I work busy. with TWR Africa. Okay. It's a global media organization, mainly based in the States, but we work across okay. around the world. And okay. so my responsibility is on media research in Africa. Oh, wonderful. And so That's when great. I present a media, a media perspective of a certain region, I basically put the foresight framework together and, mm -hmm. and say, well, here, these are the sort of things we want to be looking at. Good. Well, now, that's terrific. Often I have not, a, 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 a guy who was in media in Los Angeles. I have a great story when he uh, when he took over as the director of market research for one of the major U.S. broadcasting networks. And I said, I said, okay. how's it going? He said, well, I go around and I talk to people in the market research field. I feel like they are documenting the death of the field to the fourth significant digit. <laughs> I love that phrase. In other words, yeah. they were doing you know ever so thinner slices of the of the audience segmentation and things like that. He, he was about to say, "Folks, we're we're toast. Don't do that." <laughs> so there was that. Yeah. Hello, Nancy. Hey. Hi, Peter. It's good to good see to hear you. from you again. Yes, good. This yeah, is, it's a great presentation. Great for getting in touch. I love your bird. Oh, that's a seagull. Um, hey, your friend. <laughs> it turns out that my. Oops, you froze up. Sorry. Oh, and then she goes away. All right. It's gone I'm again. Go. All right. Yes. They should be coming back in. So Peter, so at the moment, yeah. I'm. And I'm also quite involved with the Lausanne movement, and we're really an initiative where we want to get a whole lot of. Christian influences in Africa together and talk about what has developed well in the past 10 years, what are the significant issues right now where the church needs to speak into, and what's important for the next 30 years for Africa till 2050, and what are the issues that uh, change agents need to focus on together collaboratively for the next uh, three decades. Wonderful. And so, um, yeah, it's basically a conversation we're running now till about November 2021. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's sort of, it's a bit daunting and we sort of in an area where lots of people don't have good connections, often they're not very informed about certain topics and got no clue about futures thinking right. and, and sort of, I'm just provoking people all the time to say, well, how can we think intentionally about the future and collaborate to understand the context and make meaningful contributions into society? Yeah, that's great. Good. Well, that's a that's a great application of the future. I wasn't familiar. I, I think I've heard about the Lausanne movement. I, I could not tell anybody what it means, but I guess your your involvement. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a network that started in 1974 with Billy Graham and John Stott. Oh, okay. Who knew a lot of very influential people around the world, and but these people never knew each other, so they brought them together in a huge conference. Wonderful. And so they connected with each other over the years. In 2010, there was a big Congress down in Cape Town. We also participated where they defined about 30 key issues that followers of Christ need to be addressing globally. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been doing that from environmental care to health to yeah. networking, partnering, all sorts of things. And they've been amazing things, particularly environmental network has done phenomenal things in the last years, having global gatherings and regional gatherings and really opening people's minds to the importance of caring for our planet. And it's just, yeah, uh, it's yeah. just phenomenal what has developed just in this short time. It's wonderful to hear. As I said, I had my bout in religion myself, which was much more socially progressive. Unfortunately, religion in the United States is often associated more with the conservative movement. And, uh, mm. and it's, it's a shame because there's, I mean, if the, if the Bible means anything, it's certainly taking care of the least among us, to quote another. And yes. yet, uh, they don't seem to, yes, to, exactly. um, to, to really respond to that part of the Bible. More yeah. just their own yeah. person. And so the Lausanne movement has got, us, has got a very strong focus on the marginalized people, on the 
right. the people who are really suffering, the people who are trafficked, um, poor people, and, and is, is mobilizing a lot. And uh, just two weeks ago, we had a whole global consultation about the people on the move, the refugees, mm -hmm. how to care for them, how to come around them, how to support them, and to help them to have hope. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite... Um, yeah, quite amazing what's also been done globally. Well, congratulations. I'm glad you're doing doing that. That's really important. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank you for your precious work and your <laughs> just so valuable resources that you've put together over the well, years, we, particularly with Andy. Yeah, no, it's been uh, that book is uh, was it was it was my uh, raw material coming out of the classes I was teaching. But Andy's really the writer. In our you know, yes, I, I understand that. Yes, so he, it, it, without him, it wouldn't have been published at all because he was yeah, able to yeah. put it together as a complete. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's done a phenomenal work in that. Yeah, no, and he's running a great program now. And uh, he was uh, he got his uh, PhD in December of 2012, and mm -hmm. I announced my retirement in January of 2013. <laughs> okay, <laughs> not yeah. because I was you know sick or needed to retire. I said, boy, yeah. I didn't want him to find a better opportunity. <laughs> so yeah. here you go. How about to have this room? And he knew I was doing it. It was fun. And yeah, now a few of us now also started a reading group for the whole knowledge base of future studies. That's, that's what Janine has said. Yes. Good for you. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's, it's so good. We've got lots of fun with each other. I, said, I asked her, I was on a call with her earlier this week. And I said, well, which chapter are you reading? She said, chapter. We have to read about 120 pages. Every yeah, I yeah, know. We do it section by section, so it's, it's about 50, 50 to 100 pages every two weeks. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, of but it's good. Yeah. Good for yeah, you. we're doing another one this coming Thursday. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, congratulations. We had a we had a uh, a reading group in Houston for a few years, three or four years, called Classic okay. Texts. Uh, these were okay, books that never really appeared in classes, but uh, we were okay. reading to Juvenal and Pollock um, oh, in wow. English, you know, those, uh -huh. uh, Herman Kahn and Danella Meadows and Limits to Growth and Alvin Toffler and Rachel Carson, okay. really kind oh, of the very, uh, foundational documents. It was great reading. Oh, those, wow. They, wow. they wouldn't have appeared imagine, in yes. classes. No. It was really nice to get, to get associated with them. So you're doing some of the same thing reading through the yeah. world space. Yeah, I mean, it really motivates us to read these papers, but then also to really reflect on them and to um, bring all that together. Here we've got John appearing again. Uh, everybody okay. else Everybody's there. coming back. Hi, John. That worked well. I hope, I hope. There's a lot of material on the mural board. Okay, good. That's That's what we want. We want lots of great material. Now I haven't broken up the next the two next two questions into into separate groups. Everybody, but everybody can work on the same board, even so, in the small groups. Okay, so they'll be in the small group for discussion, but then they yeah. can post their small group on the same board. Yeah, the next uh, collaborations are both just uh, uh, one question. Yeah. Can you, Peter? Can you see the board? Uh, I haven't got it up right now, but I'm, okay. Just hold on a sec. I'm gonna. I'm, a, I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, you want to put it up so that people can. Yeah, just hold on. Here it comes. It. Yeah, great. Wow. <laughs> somebody, okay. somebody said that this this process looks like the. Uh, um, Harry Potter Marauders map, and it really That's does. Right. Yeah, that was referred to earlier. Yes. <laughs> uh, tell us when we're all back. Is it now, John? You think um, people are back? Yeah, I think we're all in. I think we're all back. Okay. Great. We all certainly worked hard, created lots of great material. This will be uh, a very a challenge, but also a terrific chance to uh, um, uh, to to pull this stuff down. Because I believe if we are, um, if, if we as a profession take this mission of Futures for All seriously, we're going to have to have lots of discussions about what is it that we should be sharing with the general public. And I would love to be part of that, part of that conversation. So let me turn to, uh, first of all, let's hear uh, any, any ideas. Let's do a half a dozen or so. They don't have to be the three to five that you all agreed on. 
what were ideas about, let's ask from groups one and two, on social change. If you had one or two things to tell young people or the public in general about social change, what would it be? Let's just have volunteers shout it out here. Anybody? Something that you said or some, mostly, more importantly, something somebody else said that should, whoa, I like that, <laughs> yes. Hey, Cindy, you had a good summary for our group. Why don't you just okay, say Cindy. it? Okay, Cindy. Uh, microphone, sound. Cindy? I don't, I don't have the Zoom open. All right, got it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we started out by saying the complexity, there's emergent change, right? And so that that makes uh, sort of the environment we live in and how things change. But that then we moved into, so your belief system, your worldview creates the changes that you're making, whether or not you know it, uh, mm -hmm. that you're participating but that if we're talking about what do people need to know about social change, they need to know they're affecting change. And then finally, that it needs to be for all. It needs to be a, um, it needs to be taking into account lots of different views for it to be actually beneficial social change. It can't just be the elitism of the past that it has to have. Uh, that to incorporate all views is one of the things that we've done wrong. Um, there were some other things about things we've done wrong that were social changes change, maybe change not something we're that good at. Change for subsets rather than for the general general. We've well, been it's been a habit. It's easier, right? For them. <laughs> well, I don't know that it's easier. It certainly does serve certain interests. So uh, two or three other comments about change. Uh, I'll change. do yeah, ours, please. Peter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Get to that mirror board. Sorry. Right. No. Okay. Uh, individuals have agency. So right. We do have agency. Uh, we need to learn to tell stories. Mm -hmm. That's nice, okay. And that we can use cartoons, games, and play to show that change can support a better future for more people. Great, okay, Joyce, thank you very much. Those are three really, really great things. Let's do one or two more. Anybody else want to contribute a, a nugget that they got in the conversation, heard somebody else say, or something that they said? Okay. You mean from uh, groups one and two? Yeah, yeah, one and two, yeah. Anybody else? Well, let's go to two, the three and four then. Uh, what, what, how, about anticipation? Go ahead. I'd like to put up my idea, because I, I said it, but that was probably too complicated. I talked about, a lens of which I'm make, talking about social change right now. Right. That the acronym I've been working with is one smart. Okay, so smart, have the smart phone. So I'm trying to find something that's sticky and can yeah. mean something for more people. And this basically asking people to think about five intelligences. And you talked about intelligence earlier. So right. it's spiritual intelligence, it's moral intelligence, it's analytic intelligence, it's relational intelligence, and it's um, t t temporal Temporal intelligence. Right. And, and find that way to, so I've been using it with groups I'm working with who are not futurists to see if that would make it stick in their head a little bit faster. Okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. So um, any others from three and four about anticipation, about the, the world we're heading towards? Amy, go for it. Oh, no, you're talking to somebody else. <laughs> I thought you were um, signaling I, to us. I can, oh, speak, yeah, for, uh, I can speak for group three. Uh, sure. We, uh, we began by talking about what futurists do uh, and how they work. And MJ had the great phrase that we tickle the present to produce the future. Uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron had us thinking more about core concepts uh, and what they could be. I suggested some tools and you could see them here in our, in our mural board. Um, and one of the, then we thought, well, what about core concepts? Like, you know, what, if, what does financial literacy have? And one of the concepts that came up was, your plan might not work out. So I offered the great Mike Tyson quote, which you can all see. But yeah, then, right. we, then we lined up back with uh, groups one and two uh, because we had the question of uh, social inequality. That is, uh, if for accounting, for example, a core concept is compound interest, most people have no access to that in the, in the real world. Uh, so we thought about, all right, what concepts would actually apply to everybody about the future? Uh, uh, Vern gave us the great question, what do we do about the people who have no future to anticipate? Uh, and then uh, David and others, I think, uh, gave us the answers that we should think about social change through 
civics and voting. Uh, mm -hmm. And secondly, we should think about the fact that everybody has a responsibility for the future in the form of the phrase, be a good ancestor. Good, that's great, yes. Be committed to future mm -hmm. generations, right, being a good ancestor. Wonderful, okay, let's turn to groups uh, five and six then about uh, creating change or influencing change. Ideas for, for the students or the general public about that? We, so we had, we were group five. We yeah. had sort of four things, we categories, I guess, of things that we talked about. We talked about opportunities, knowledge, strategies, and, and assessment, and, and opportunities for teaming and working across classes and not having like, okay, here's your futures class, and now you're done. And also opportunities for co-creating and this meta reflexive opportunities to develop, you know, some of those ideas. And even the health for all is, is kind of like an opportunity that this becomes something that is valued. Mm -hmm. yeah. Under knowledge, things like um, thinking about your metaphors, changing your metaphors, how does change happen? You know, figuring out things about change and how we could actually make change happen. And then, um, then we talked about sort of strategies that led into strategies and that is how do you influence? So it's not just how does change happen, but how do you then actually work? And that might be community work or whatever. Right. And we had actually a good conversation about assessment. You know, if we're going to do something like this, how do we know we have an impact? Right. And so being able to kind of feed back into to the system to understand did people go out and actually create change? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great, Jane. Thank the you group, very much. I hope I got everything. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Any others from five for five and six? So, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. oh. Go ahead. Um, so gonna, oh, was, uh, I've kind of done a quick verb analysis of the things that we put in. Oh, and uh, so this is Amy Magnus. Yeah, um, Amy, thanks. So the, uh, uh, and um, the, the, the list that it seems to kind of go in is C, create this kind of, gen, you know, massive generation process, then mm -hmm. focus and form. The, those are kind of like the pervasive um, uh, verbs that were included in the discussion. So oh, that'd I thought be terrific. that. A very high yeah. level description there. That's great, Amy. Thank you. Yeah, Lonnie, was that you? Yeah, yeah. I would just say thanks. Thanks, uh, um, Lonnie. Um, I say uh, being radically inclusive, um, kind of seeing the future from other cultural perspectives, from indigenous futurism to Afrofuturism to queer futures, and really having rounding that out. Um, yeah. Good. Thank you very much, Lonnie. That's uh, and, and everybody for playing the collaboration game. <laughs> I'm new to this, but it uh, it's been terrific. Uh, let me uh, kind of conclude this section on uh, what uh, what everybody should know with the two stories. Uh, first of all, uh, the major point is that we, we, and I will put myself in that category up until a two, couple of years ago, uh, are, we tend to share what we believe is the excitement and the value of the profession. So we are futurists or foresight professionals, and that we like to tell people about the field, about uh, what we do, how we do it, the methods, the techniques, the theories, the history, the major thinkers and things like that. And I believe that that's wonderful stuff, except that it's not the same as Futures for All. Uh, most of the people don't want to hear about that. <laughs> Thank you. It's not going to be valuable to them. I mean, this is, I, I mean, I, I don't want to be too critical of my own field of education, but how many times are we sitting listening to boring, you know, <laughs> discussions of what excites the professor and is of absolutely no value whatsoever uh, to the students? So um, I have two stories uh, that I want to share. One is from my wife, actually. She was a professional, a, a, a school administrator, the head of a private school in Houston. And she had two amazing teachers in her fine arts department. One was the drama teacher. And she was terrific, a great coach, a great director, really developed talent, and she was winning awards for their productions all over the city. Really, really phenomenal. Everybody respected what she did. 
the other teacher was a guy who was, who was basically in charge of the music department in fine arts, and he had a different purpose. Uh, at the end of the very first semester in which a student took a course from him, they were able to play at least one, if not more than one instrument well enough to appear on stage during the assemblies and the things like that. So he was music for all. <laughs> and he was not giving them, you know, lots of, you know, all this very fine tuned direction about being a, a pianist. Uh, this, is, this is the chords, go for the chords. And he's actually developed a whole curriculum and a whole strategy for, for doing this kind of thing. Both of them, brilliant teachers, both of them serving kids, with, but with two very different purposes. And so I had to get out of, when I started Teach the Future, I had to get out of teaching people kind of a junior version of what we were teaching graduate students in the University of Houston. And I have to tell you, it was only a few, few years ago that I got out of that. And I'm not completely out of that because that's what we were teaching. But what is it that, that the general public needs to know versus, versus the other? Uh, the second story has to do with, I was, we were asked by a futures organization to develop a syllabus for a university. And I worked with two or three other foresight professionals to do that. And I lost the battle. I said, this, this is for undergraduates in this thing. It's, we're not building futures. No, no. They wanted to go into the methods and they wanted to go into the theories and they wanted to go into the history and all of that kind of stuff. And I was outvoted two to one. <laughs> I said, they, they don't want to know all that. I mean, this is a great introduction to a group that's going to become futurists. You know, that's what the, the course that Terry used to teach in Houston was the intro to future studies. And that's what all that was about. But it, if that's the only futures course you're going to take, you need to have these more fundamental things. So that's the distinction I'm making. And I think one that we, and, and I will tell you that it, it doesn't come, I mean, it seems obvious but the practice of it does not come easily because we're in the habit of thinking and talking and acting as professionals because most of our work is with other professionals, either as, as graduate instructors or as you know, consultants or work doing research projects for companies or government agencies. So we are at the professional level almost all the time, actually talking to real people about the future and what they need to know and what they need to be able to do uh, is uh, is a, it's it's a different kind of a thing. Peter, so, could you just give us a expand? It's fascinating. Just expand a little bit more on what you would actually tell people in serving um, that. Well, I didn't. I I, I have uh, all that. I have that material, but I didn't want to present it now <laughs> to force all the discussion. I wanted to hear all your ideas. I have one slide on that. Uh, I also have a file, a document, which I call the 15 things. Uh, this is, you know, the, with all of the scientific rigor of a Facebook post or a BuzzFeed list, this is what everybody should know about the future. And I have that. And however this goes on, I would be delighted to share it with you. It's still a work in process. I, I do, I'm not committed to it all. It has five things about change five things about anticipation, and five things about influence. So uh, I, I appreciate the question. I think if we got into it now, it would forestall that. I have one slide that is kind of the summary slide of the kind of things that I would teach that counteract what people already think about the future so that we give them a different perspective and, and that will be coming up. So I, I thank you for the question. I don't, think, I don't think it would be advisable right now to get into all of those things, because all I'll do is, is raise, the, raise the hackles of everybody. Well, what about my thing? And what about your thing? <laughs> I, we, but we have to have that discussion. I'll, you know, you, you, you uh, as representatives of the field, have put all your ideas on Miro. I have my ideas. We have other people who are teaching the future. We have more than 100 foresight educators in Teach the Future who've signed up for a Google group, not as active as it could be, but having the conversation about what this curriculum would look like. I, I really draw the, the comparison with the APF competencies that Jay and Andy and that task force put together, which are terrific, but they're not what everybody needs to know. So we, if, we, if, if we did a, an alternative, a second task force, what does everybody need to know? Then we could actually put that out. And so I appreciate the question. I'd rather not get into the details of all of that right now. But I think some of the things you've said already, uh, the future is multiple, it's not single. 
uh, change. Uh, if you want to create change and it's important, then it's going to take a long time. <laughs> uh, you do need collaboration. You have to. You generally can't do it by yourself. Uh, things happen. Change is continuous, and then, then there's a disruption, and then it's continuous again, and then there's a disruption. That's an, that's just a smattering of the kind of things that I would put in there. So thank you for the question. So uh, let's go to. I don't know that we're going to do the other. The, the second collaboration, as an educator, I always think of knowledge, skills, and attitudes, KSAs they're called. <laughs> and uh, and the next collaboration was to be, what are the future skills? I think a lot of people put that on the Miro board already. I don't want it to, I don't want to be redundant. And we might actually save a little bit of time and give you the rest of your life back uh, after this, this four day extravaganza. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, what what are the kind of things that you would put on there? Let's just have a group discussion, not discussion, but just put things, if you were to put skills on the Miro board that we should be sharing with the general public so they can deal with change, they can anticipate and influence the future. And, and that list is kind of pretty obvious, but what would be those things? Oh, you want to you want to go with that, John? If people do. Do we want to have a, a skills collaboration? Yes. Yeah, no? It's good to talk and write at the same time, if that's okay. So oh, it is. Oh, okay. All right. We can do it as a group, Peter. Yeah. Right. That's what I thought. Rather than break out, and and we can you know do it a little bit more quickly. So, who would like to propose a skill for the Miro board in order to understand change, in order to anticipate and influence change? Perry? I'll, I'll take the easy one, that there's multiple futures and you okay. can influence which one you, you are on. All right, so the skill is to be able to pick. Skill is identifying values and preferences and articulating those and appreciating other people's. So that, that would definitely be a skill. Thanks, Terry. What, who else? Skills. There's a skill in uh, distinguishing levels of generality. Okay, all right. So big picture ideas, medium, small, narrow, and that's kind of systems thinking, right? Be able to see the whole the whole picture. I was going to say something similar. That's um, yeah. basically surfacing and examining assumptions. Assumptions, yes, right, absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Yes, Claire. To be able to think both and. Go ahead. It's instead of either or. Oh, have, <laughs> yeah. People instead Try of to... either this or that. It's black or white. So <laughs> that would be handling ambiguity, maybe. Right. Yes. And and merging opposites. You know, not either or, both and. I mean, that's a form of thinking which has a long history. It's called dialectics. I mean, Hegel and Marx and all of those bringing opposites together to form a new synthesis. So it's not just one or the other. I mean, if we have one of the most critical habits, I think, that education creates is the right and wrong answer, which is a binary choice. What's the right answer? What's the wrong answer? Getting the right answer in almost every subject, science, math, history, wherever, getting the right answer gets you the grade gets you the promotion, gets you, you know, to wherever, wherever you're going. If we were teaching both and multiple answers, not only multiple futures, I think we would have a much more sophisticated population. So the ability to think and merge opposites is a great skill. Good. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, Who else? I have one. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. Uh, oh, yeah, and uh, you go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. it's, I'll be very quick. Uh, I Please. be a systems, be a systems thinker and okay. see how things relate. Right. Seeing holes rather than just parts, treating things as a whole, great. And well, seeing great. the parts relate to one another. Exactly, the connections, yeah. Amy, how about you? So there's a couple of skills that we see. One is the moving from pre-contemplation to contemplation. So okay. managing uh, this disruption. So like our early intervention therapists who are working with opioid addictive infants. They're specifically working on helping the infants develop mechanical coping skills. So there's that, you know, moving from pre-contemplation to contemplation, which in the trans theoretical model, they talk about dramatic relief. The second one is getting good at mechanizing moving between 
contemplation and engagement. And this is something we see in the narrative analysis and biometrics is that masters are really good at flipping that switch of moving from a simple, you know, simple, highly regulated order into disorder. Wow, you're really talking about sophisticated learning and, and, uh, and action and thinking skills. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who else? I'm Peter. gonna go to the second screen here. Does anybody wanna raise their hand on this? Peter? Yeah, go ahead. We have a tolerance for change. Yes. Okay. On your list. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Being, being able to deal with change and, and, and recognizing, I always tell people, I hate change, <laughs> but, <laughs> you but it's be. coming. <laughs> right. Peter, my, my, what, was the, what was the quote that you, sh you used to have at the bottom of your emails? Change is hard, change. but stagnation is fatal. Right. I love that. <laughs> In fact, my daughter used to say, Dad, you're a futurist, but you always sit in the same chair to watch TV. <laughs> I said, yeah, I don't like change any more than anybody else. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, other skills? There are, there's a great list. Well, I think also don't, don't, don't people need to learn to think ahead? I mean, to think forward. Right. I mean, right. basically, that's what we usually try to teach people is how to right. think longer term than they're comfortable and the reason, and where we learn, where we, the reason we don't learn this in school is because teachers forget the difference between content and skills. They know how to teach history because they have the facts of history fairly well established, certainly at the general education level. They don't want to teach the future because they don't know what's going to happen. So I can't teach them about what's going to happen. And our response is yes, but teach them about how to investigate that and how to think about that. I have to tell you that as prestigious as an organization as the OECD made that same mistake. They've, done, they've had a project going on for many, many years called Education 2030. I hope 2030 is better than 2020, Education 2030, in which they were developing the competencies for the next generation to recommend to their clients, their constituents, and things like that. So wonderful. I was involved in that for a while. We finally got to the point of a list of competencies. And I said, we need to put foresight and future thinking on that list. And they said, no, it's not a competency. It's a content <laughs> Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> and, I, and I had to withdraw. I mean, I, you got it wrong and in a, in a blazingly amazing way. This is a skill. This is not content because uh, compared to the past, there are no facts. We know that from John de Juvenal. There are no future facts and therefore we only teach processes. We only teach skills. And, but teachers who are used to teaching content in science and history and math and everything else, unfortunately. Uh, Go ahead, you want, Peter. Go ahead, Rosa. Imagination. Imagination. Imagination fitness, or just like imagination plasticity. So imagination should have, you know, to be a, a have a demand in schools and training to expand it because we need the word is lacking imagination. And 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 there there our educational system and our whole society is quotes evidence based. And evidence is great. I mean, evidence is wonderful for forming conclusions and things like that. What we forget is that the flip side of that is imagination, intuition, and innovation, which you cannot prove. So we don't cover that much in school. And yet, I, I, when I'm talking to business professors, for instance, who are the brilliant business leaders of, of the last hundred years? Yeah, they knew a lot about finance and they knew a lot about whatever, but they were also highly creative and highly imaginative. Are you teaching your MBA students that? Uh, generally not. So you're right, imagination and creativity, definitely skills. You know, yeah, I have it, one other. Please, I mean, no, ahead, they, Cindy. They, they were talking about um, earlier, Peter, uh, Peter and Ruben, I think we're talking about the idea of uh, assumptions, but also not just identify assumptions, but to sort of categorize them or put them in steep domains or, or put them in our social change explanations or a way to put them in a file cabinet so you can identify what where somebody's coming from and why you have a difference. And, well, I understand, uh, first of all, the assumptions that we're, we're making ourselves. Yes, ourselves. <laughs> and first, then yes. recognizing it in other people and realizing that assumptions are not facts. They're not truths, they're beliefs. 
So there, there, there's a degree of uncertainty and therefore we give people the benefit of the doubt. That's your assumption. I don't agree with it necessarily. And that would be a wonderful conversation to have. But you understand that there is a difference. Yeah. Right. And that's, uh, that's where the difference lies. It's not necessarily in the facts. It's in uh, those assumptions. And I would add on, you know, just the idea of Jedi, you know, justice, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion okay. as a core skill to bring forward into the future, because the future has to have a context mm -hmm. and a social justice one. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, what it, about compassion? Important. Compassion too, yes, right. We're working on a, a futures consciousness scale uh, with some researchers in Finland and, and the UK. And they have five dimensions. And I questioned this one dimension. One of their dimensions was empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, how is that, you know, a future mm. skill? And they said, no, it has to be there. And so, yeah, empathy, that type of uh, compassion. Uh, interestingly, Peter, just, yes. just for a second, uh, I, as we've been in this COVID era, what has emerged in terms of what's necessary for leaders is empathy. And it's become so important that I've begun to talk about the fact that maybe we should be measuring EMQ. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, that's great. And there are some very good measures of that as well. Yes, Annette. Uh, I just want to not leave Jedi too quickly and, okay. and reinforce that because we've been talking about uh, social inclusion kind of as a thread through this, but and a lot of this comes back to uh, team building uh, and being, you know, mixing everything up in your processes. And so you really need to know how to collaborate and also you need to have uh, relationships. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Well, let me, let me call a halt to this one. If you have more ideas as we go along, we've got a little bit more time left. You've got the board, put stuff on the board. What skills do you believe should be included in the, um, um, uh, the, uh, in that. Let me uh, go back to um, the presentation. Uh, which of these do I want? Yeah, this is the same one, right? Okay. All right, so um, let me share with you a quote that I get from a colleague of mine in Canada. I don't know this person, Richard Ogle, but it really did impress me of why we, had why we have education as a backwardly looking rather than a forward looking process. Um, it's um, it, because we believe that education is primarily a transmission rather than a creation. And where do you get the material to transmit except out of the past? So rationalism and, and knowledge rationality are the two things which are primary in education. Now, I, I'm not going to say they shouldn't be, <laughs> but as, as primary and exclusionary, no. So we always look backward and versus some of the skills you've talked about, insight, intuition, innovation, creativity, those kinds of things are things that we should be teaching along with rationality and knowledge. It's not either or again, it's, it's one versus the other. So the, um, um, let me share, the question was, well, what would I be teaching? And that's a really long question. <laughs> that's a really long answer, and I won't do that right now. But I do have three words that I use as a kind of a mantra that I believe that distinguishes, I created them to distinguish foresight thinking from what I'll call traditional forecast, forecasting and planning. I think it could serve in this, in this purpose as well. Actually, I got this because the, uh, the administrator at NASA, the University of Houston Clear Lake was right next to the Johnson Space Center, still is. And um, he came up with a ma uh, mantras for NASA, which was better, cheaper, and faster. Naive, at least. <laughs> you know, they got good. <laughs> they certainly didn't get better, and they didn't get cheap at all, right? Terry worked on that <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> so uh, I came up with three terms that I think could be used, not not, this, this isn't the overview, but could be used in this revolution in thought. And the first of that is wider. Uh, we have a penchant because you have to get the right answer is towards specialization uh, big, and narrowness and looking at parts exclusively compared to their connection with other parts or indeed to the whole. So we're talking about steep. 
And what we get response from students and participants in certificate courses is, oh, I can't think about all that at the same time. And I said, well, if you leave anything of that off, you're at risk. It's easy to get caught by change coming out of that. So you got to do it. Yeah, it's not the same. You're not going to come up a catalog of all the changes, but that. And then systems thinking, seeing holes and seeing parts and treating society as a system rather than as a collection of just individuals or institutions and things like that. So we tend to ask people to think more widely, not that, not that specialization and narrow thinking is, doesn't have, it has its place, but as an exclusive way of thinking, clearly not. The second term in the mantra is deeper. We're the people who don't just think about the world and certainly about the future, but about the assumptions that go into how we think about that, how our beliefs about the world works and our values about what's right and what's wrong and what's important become most important there. And I should have put, I was thinking of putting, this is where the uncertainty comes in. You, there is inherent uncertainty. Everybody realizes that now with COVID. Well, you should have realized it 10 years ago. <laughs> there is inherent uncertainty. And in that sense, it do, it, part of it comes out of our assumptions and therefore the alternatives, alternative futures, alternative perspectives. And then finally is longer. We're the people who talk not just the change and even the immediate effect of the change, but what effect is that gonna have? The dominoes falling out there into the distant future. And therefore, we get to judgments and value and preferences, which is which consequences do we want and which consequences not, which consequences are society uh, promoting and supporting and which consequences are they not. And I would say that just as a one chart way, I could teach classes on this as a way of getting to futures for all. It's not the only thing. We have a lot more material, but there's an example of the answer that I think to, to the particular question. So there's, a, there's one for, for whatever it is. So let's turn to um, the action side of collaboration. Uh, we are not just learning to understand, we are learning to act. And I was happy to see Jay, I grabbed this as a screenshot, Jay, off your conclusion to the town hall earlier today, which I would take as the three main pillars of the APF mission. And it's great, we're a community of members, we serve the members, and that was our mantra right from the beginning. We're not gonna get into business, we're not going to compete with our members, that's their business, we are going to help them and support them in doing that. But I realized there was something missing in that particular mission, and I hate to call you out right now and the rest of the APF right now, but this is a, a collaboration <laughs> among uh, colleagues, and I hope we can have a conversation about that. I thought we had a third pillar in the foundation of the APF that had more to do with representing the field to the world not just serving its members. I was serving the members, but by being a spokesperson, by being the face of the field to the rest of the world. And I couldn't find that list, but I did find an article that Andy wrote in 2007 that I think captured some of the same thing. Uh, networking, a community was obviously item number one, and then improving the image and the performance of the field. I think if you separate those two things out, that's, those are uh, one of them, including the performance of the field. Both of those are externally oriented. And so with due respect, I think this mission, these first three bullets that Jay shared, I don't see the outreach in there. I don't see the stuff that people have been talking about that I've got a chance to participate in all day long. We need to do something. We need to improve this and do that and the other thing. So that's one action that could come about is a reflection on the stated mission. I think we all have this in our hearts, but whether that's the stated mission and whether we're going to apply resources and time and functions to, to reaching out into the world rather than simply serving ourselves. So that's one item. And then I saw this, Terry. <laughs> this was a, a, a screenshot from Terry and, and Trisha's uh, AI board from today. And I was, I, I mean, talk about being gobsmacked. Look at all that teaching stuff in there. Everybody said, put it in the high school curriculum, put it in the college curriculum, teach the future, support foresight, teaching in secondary ed, blah, blah, blah. That's the first thing I saw. I didn't do any of that because those were all created yesterday and the day before. And so I was delighted to see. So uh, uh, as I said early on, 
if you are want to be a leader, uh, find out where the people are going and follow them. <laughs> so if we want to be leaders, if we want, and this is what the, this is your AI. Terry, do you want to give people a context for those who may not have uh, um, shared, uh, been in that session? Um, well, we, we looked at what we did well and discover. And then on the second day, we dreamed about, you know, what we could do going forward. What's the dream of us as futurists? And there was a lot about futurists being a way of life and teaching it. And we even had the, the term um, futures uh, literacy. Um, so all of that came out as a really important part of what we're dreaming about as futurists and for the APF. And, and frankly, I mean, there were a lot of other dreams in there too. I don't, want to, I don't want to discount the rest of the dreams in there, but I grabbed this one as, as particularly appropriate, I thought, for what I was trying to say, futures for all, I think this is, this is, in, our, this is in our hearts already. And if it, it's in our minds, and then we can begin to take action on it by definitely. So the call to action then. Uh, we have three major international global futures organizations in existence today. The APF, I, uh, as I said, perhaps the, the leading one, certainly for practitioners and professionals, the World Future Studies Federation and the Millennium Project. Um, we should, what should we do to bring about futures for all? Should we take that on as a mission? Is this our responsibility as foresight professionals to do what we can? And I'm, 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 I'm really absenting myself from my work and teach the future, definitely want to be involved, but this is really a bigger thing than just one organization. Are we going to, are we going to do some of that? So our third collaboration basically has that as the question. What actions can we do, should we do as a profession or a professional association? to bring about this communication of this way of thinking, this revolution in thought to the general population, and I would believe, obviously, to the younger generation. I mean, my, we had a vision in the beginning of the APF, and that was to sit down with a group of people who didn't say, tell me what, what a futurist does. <laughs> I mean, that was a very simple vision. It was, it was almost naive. We just didn't, we just, I mean, we, we don't mind answering that question, but every time we meet somebody, that's what we're, what we're talking to. So we wanted a group of people, we, we'd skip all that, and we could get on to talk about other things. So this is a very simple thing. In other words, what, uh, what can we do to bring this about into, in, into, the, uh, into the world? And in that sense, it's a vision that we don't have to, when we start a, a certificate program or we start a consulted consultation or we start a research project for a client, we don't have to start educating them about what foresight is. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they learned it in high school, <laughs> if they learned it in college? And so that we don't have to start there, we just start, you know, I mean, it's like saying, you know, you went up, if, if you were gonna do math problem for somebody, do a calculation, you wouldn't have to start with the history of math. <laughs> you wouldn't have to start telling what math is about, why it's there, but they learned it all. Science, same way, history, the same way. Wouldn't it be nice 100 years from now where our, our descendants, our successors, were able to start an, an engagement with, with them already understanding that kind of thing? So the question is, what should we do to bring that about? What are the potential actions for that? That's the question. This will be uh, six groups, but uh, all answering the same question. Actions to bring futures thinking, these ideas, what we know about the future and change in the future to the rest of the world. Okay, any questions? All right, John, pull the trigger here. Okay, I think Mary is still has the same groups.
a um, lot of really great ideas. Um, is anybody, I mean, we only have a few minutes left and I certainly don't want to uh, end right on the hour. Is there an idea or an action that you think is so hot that you would want to share with the rest of the group? So hot. And so something that, oh, I never thought about that before. Why don't we do that? Yes, Amy yes, please, said, please. Amy said right. the, the key is to create a marriage of wonder and purpose. Wow. Amy, just, you saw my last slide, the one I'm going to show right now. Good for you. Me I love away. It. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and yeah, we're going to end on that note. Thank you for, pre, you know, previewing that. All right. Other ideas. Yeah, well, I'm going to go. Uh, oh, please, because Charles. I've been pushing this for quite a long time. I know you have. Thank you very much for doing it. Well, you don't, you may or may not know what I'm going to say next. I hope. Um, and I pushed it in my little group, but I'm going to push it here again. Okay. If, if we were Steve Jobs uh, and our product was Apple computers, what we would be doing is trying to identify the early adopters, those who were most interested in Apple computers, even if they didn't understand what they were, but they were just inclined to be looking at Apple computers. We'd be trying to find them as best we could and put our stuff in their hands. I think that was done um, in the 1960s when a group of people who didn't really understand the future, but who thought there was something to think about there created the World Future Society. And what they did accidentally in North America primarily, but the fact that it extended around the world indicated that this had traction around the world was they found a whole bunch of early adopters who were so excited and so inspired that they showed up once a year and they bought the futurist in great measure. Now, once foresight practitioners caught onto this, we didn't like very much what they did. Um, <laughs> and we actually thought it was pretty shallow and pretty simplistic, the least of which, not the least of which was their bloody name, which didn't even have an S on future. Uh, and so what did we do? We split off. We created our own organization. And we let them go on their own. And then we tried to link up with them as best we could. Well, they're dead now. They're gone. They've They've, they realized that their time had come. But I think there's the same need is there. The same evidence is there that there are people out there who are prepared to invest in this stuff. They don't understand what it is. And the one thing the World Future Society got from that process, one thing it got was a huge amount of traction and a huge amount of visibility. Uh, and it got its ears and its chief executive into all sorts of places. So I reckon the APF ought to start up the World Futures Society. <laughs> <laughs> as a separate parallel organization and then ought to feed all of us into it as best we can. Did you put that on a, did you put that on the board? No, I didn't. I just put it out verbally. Please, you got to put it on the board else it'll go away. So let me talk about the 1960s. You and I both remember those days. <laughs> okay. Um, in the 19, once we created the APF, I realized that, that there were four global futures organizations in the world. Three of them I've already talked about the APF, the Federation, and the Millennium Project, and then the World Future Society. And I realized that each of us had a lane in the road. Each of us had a particular mission serving a particular audience. We broke off from the World Future Society because their lane in the road was the general public. They were serving the general interested public and they were doing a good job of it in my estimation. As professionals, we complained all the time, I realized, but they were not serving professionals. So we created another organization. We didn't kill the World Future Society. For, that's, a, that's a whole different story. So there is no organization today that can really mine that intense interest in the future with magazines, with conferences, with those kind of things. Even though it seems simplistic and naive, it is better than not talking about the, I always thought, better than not talking about the future at all. So I, I agree with you, Charles. I don't know that the APF can create because, you know, if you're one thing and you try and become two things, oftentimes you don't do either one of them very well. So how, where is there an entrepreneur out there like uh, Ed Cornish and others who could create this popular organization that was interested in the future? Uh, I wish, I wish I knew. And, but you're right, that, that, that there's a hole there in terms of a road for the futures for the public to participate 
They're not futurist professionals. They're not international academics like the Federation. They're not a research organization like the Millennium Project nodes. I don't know. Peter, so, good idea, Charles. Thank, go ahead. Peter, allow me to come at that from a slight different angle. Yeah. The question you asked is, what can we do as professionals to actually cope with this situation? Uh, I think I'm the only person, uh, we did it as Foresight Canada, who actually invited the executive of APF and the executive of the Federation to meet together. It's only happened once in history, happily. <laughs> was, and, and actually some comments were made that largely, that occasionally are followed up on, uh, but to begin to recognize uh, each other um, and to, to uh, work together where they can. That's still a passion I have because Canadians are far more multilateral than Americans. We're so small, when we go out in the dark, we have to hold hands. <laughs> Americans are big enough when they go out in the dark, they just carry a big stick and say to other people, fuck off. Okay. Uh, and um, what, okay. the, what we could do as APF is invite the Federation and the Millennial Project to create a joint task force to take your question seriously to take this issue seriously right. and say, let's assign some of our best people who are willing to work and will make time and priority to actually develop a joint proposal to deal with in a staged way, where would we start? Uh, what, what's the initial project, but where might that go over time uh, to actually bring futures for all into some fruition. It may result in some reformation of the of WSF, but it may not. In yeah. other words, it would be a totally different kind of thing. And I think given the, uh, the mutual strength of these bodies, given the Federation's access to UNESCO and established bodies, which we don't have, mm -hmm. my sense is that a really well-formed proposal could attract foundation money uh, in a way that whatever you and others are doing uh, is not. That's not a shot at you. We find the same thing in Foresight Canada. None of us are working at a scale that attracts serious foundation money. Right. Okay, Raven, thank you very much. That's great. John, you wanted to come in? I just want to emphasize that, that we don't have to control something to collaborate on it. And, <laughs> Wonderful. and, and yeah, it's not a power trip. Um, and, and we can support others doing things that we're not doing ourselves. Thanks, John. So these ideas are good. That's excellent. Annette? Um, I'm going to suggest reaching out to some of the old guard, and I'm talking about way back to the 80s in WFS, where there were some really heavy hitters, and talking about sociologists, Amitai Etzioni was one of them, but I'm talking about um, the folks at uh, uh, Kurzweil, uh, Peter Schwartz, you know, all kind of these big name ones, but that were very involved with WFS, uh, Clem Beasold. I mean, Clem was intimately involved with WFS and do some um, reaching out on an individual basis and okay. see what you can approach them with in the way of activities and, 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 and building of APFF and in this other direction or building it out. Right. Thank you, Annette. Appreciate it. We only have a couple more minutes, and John uh, very gently said, <laughs> get off the stage. It's almost time. I have one more slide, but I'll just read it for you, because it's a very uh, quote that I love uh, from Anton de Saint-Exupéry. I apologize for the French of all the people. He's the guy that wrote The Little Prince, I think, pretty much, pretty much sure. He says, love, and since uh, Amy mentioned love, I will say that, but I'm going to change that. Love does not consist in gazing at each other, but in looking outward together in the same direction. I would change love to community. Doing things together, in my estimation, creates bonds that an internal, purely internal kind of gazing, if, if you want to use the image, uh, does not do. And I think uh, this talk is really a call to action for the Federation, for the uh, APF particularly, to do some outreach and to begin bringing futures thinking for the future, for the benefit of future generations, not just even the generations in school today, but so that they're, they, when they turn into teachers and when they turn into foresight professionals, they will then carry that to their children and their grandchildren and their great grandchildren. So the future generations have the insights about change in the future that we have. 
I have felt for some time that, that we have a professional responsibility to do that. And so let's work together to do it. Jay, thank you very much. John, you've been great, great support. Appreciate that. Marius, thank you for inviting me. I told Marius during the break that he was putting me in harm's way that I was going to get on a soapbox. And he said, good. <laughs> so Marius, back to you. Well, Jay, raise your right. no hands. If you want yes, to th thank you, Peter. This is just extraordinary. Folks, you've been in a master class, collaborative class of Peter Bishop and something we should do more of. Thank you so much. And let me just make some comments. Marius, you guys are superheroes. Not, not Peter and me, but your entire team labored for six or seven meetings from end of June, or end of July to bring this together. And it's extraordinary. Uh, it's a high watermark for us, at least for 2020. And uh, let's, let's keep it going, right? Um, thank you, Marius. And thank you for those that worked with him. And um, you're, you, you folks are incredible. Thank you. All right. Because of what I've sensed in just this last 30 minutes, we need to keep talking about this. The board meets next on the 23rd. We'll talk on that, you know, that 23rd. But I'm going to call another town hall. Cindy Fruin used to be very good at this. She'd call town halls to do APF business beyond the board, right? We need a members meetup that just talks about what path after collaborate you know, which future or what's next, probably what's next after Collaborate 2020. And so uh, I, I'm going to call it. We'll meet at 2 p.m. London. Peter, that's 6 a.m. your time. And Charles okay. Brass. That's great, Jay. Char I'll Charles Brass, that's 11 p.m. your time. I'm sorry for folks in India <laughs> or Saudi Arabia or something. Uh, but um, uh, that's we'll call that, all right? Number two, first Friday, October 2nd after that. Remember? Full Spectrum Futures, October 24th, uh, registered. They need proposals from diverse force, uh, voices. Uh, send them into Pratt and, uh, and, and do that. So with that, I'm going to call us uh, Collaborate 2020 to the end, but we are continuing to collaborate. And, and if Marius' uh, his declaration has circulation, it's going to last for the next 200 years. So thank you very much, Marius. Uh, thank you for the organization. We'll migrate Collaborate 2020. The boards will stay up. We'll migrate it to a web page. You can click to go to the boards, to go to the videos, to, re, you know, to recapture as well as to extend it. So thank you so much for that. Uh, any uh, last words, uh, Marius? I'll leave it to you. Thank you, Jay. Just a very short uh, last word from me. Uh, at a, on a very personal level, uh, I remember the days of... Uh, doing my MSF under Jay Gary and reading the uh, reading material and the, seeing the name Peter Bishop show up on there. And uh, that experience was a, a life-changing turning point in my own journey. And the second big one came when I became a part of the APF and got to spend time with all of you. So it's been a great pleasure to give back and, and uh, you know, reinvest some of what you've invested in my journey. And just a final word of thank you to the incredible team over the last few weeks uh, lots of hours behind the scenes. Uh, thank you to all of you, and uh, we look forward to the next collaboration. Thank you, Marius. Thank you, Marius. Thank you, Marius.